Okay, I think it's time we get started. My name is Michael Perel. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Entomology. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our store lecturer for today. Uh, this is May's second presentation, so I'm going to give a similar uh, introduction as I did yesterday. I'm also going to show the same video again. I know there are some different people here. I'm hoping the sound will work with the video. We'll see how that, how that goes. Uh, I do want to apologize for those that might have tried to, uh, to come at, at 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock for, for a sort of a mid-afternoon seminar uh, by May. We ended up canceling that. had nothing to do with May. She was definitely ready to give the presentation. There were other extraneous circumstances that kind of interfered. So again, I appreciate everyone coming here. Uh, as you know, the store lecture in the College of Biological Sciences is uh, phenomenal for bringing, you know, incredible people, incredible talent to the Davis campus. Uh, May is one of those people that excel in their science, but yet uh, basically do a lot more in terms of sort of outreach and education in society uh, with respect to science in general. And certainly May fits that fits that bill. Uh, she is. Um, uh, basically a graduate of summa cum laude graduate in biology from Yale University, received a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University, and then on to uh, the University of Illinois, where she is currently professor and chair of the department. And I think many of you know, if you know that department, it's clearly one of the top departments of entomology in the country. May's research, as you can see, and you probably read, and you already know about her work, deals with chemical interactions between insects and host plants and their implications for community organization. And, uh, and species uh, evolution as well. But, uh, so that's her science in a sense, but she does a lot more than that. She's published three books on insect fact and folklore. She writes a monthly or, or a column regularly for American entomologists. She's published widely. She consults in a lot of different venues, is commonly on Capitol Hill, dealing with legislatures, trying to influence science policy. A lot of that work recently is focused on sort of pollinators and honeybees. We heard a little bit about that uh, yesterday. You know, some, some fascinating and really significant uh, uh, things that, that she is doing that has implications at the national level. Uh, of course, she has been honored uh, many times. She is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, or I'm, I'm sorry, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the AAAS. She's also a fellow of the two ESAs, right? Entomological Society of America and the Ecological Society of America, and also the American Philosophical Society. In 2011, she received the USC Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, and you can read there, I'll, I'll do it here, right? It's given to those individuals who have, con who have contributed in an outstanding manner to scientific knowledge and public leadership to preserve and enhance the environment of the world. In 2016, I, I think she doesn't like, like this sort of heralded, but she will be the president, the fifth uh, female president of the Entomological Society of America, presiding over the International Congress of Entomology that will be held in 2016 in Orlando, Florida. And that will be, without, without a doubt, the largest uh, I'll say collection of entomologists ever assembled at one meeting. There are, uh, there's an expectation of more than 7,000 uh, people attending, attending that meeting. And then one of uh, May's claims to fame is sort of a connection to Hollywood and to television. So she consults and she uh, deals a lot with sort of scripts that, that, uh, that appear in both Hollywood and on television. And one of the most famous interactions, maybe she can talk about that before her presentation, she corrected me a little bit in, uh, yesterday, was her involvement in uh, the X-Files, some of the episodes there. And so they actually named a character after uh, May in one of the episodes. And so basically the episode, and I'm going to show, uh, I realize there are a lot of X-File fans in the audience, um, and maybe some of you have seen this, maybe some of you haven't, but I'm going to correct that deficiency in your life now, I hope. I'm going to show a 40-second uh, video that sort of uh, f showcases uh, basically on, on uh, the, the character that, that bears uh, uh, May, May's name. Uh, the episode deals with uh, cockroaches, of course, deals with insects, cockroaches, but they're not just any cockroaches, they are actually killer robots from outer space. So that's the theme of the uh, X-Files. Maybe we're not going to see that. Abdomen still attached, and he differentiates species by their genitalia. 
Oh, my God. Is it abnormal? I'll say. He's hung like a club-tailed dragonfly. <laughs> Excuse me. Does it still look unusual? Well, yes. For an insect genitalia. But maybe not for a microprocessor. Okay, with that, please join me in welcoming mate Mary Berenbaum. Thank you. Am I, am I on? Am I on? Let's see. Okay. Well, it's always uh, just a, a real pleasure to come to Davis. There's so many people I know from so many different phases of my life. It's sort of like old home week. Uh, with respect to Dr. Van de Berenbaum, am I on? Can you hear? Nope. All right. Can someone unmute me? Am I unmuted? Yeah. All right. I'm also wired with two mics, and I, you know, I feel like uh, if I go through airport security, I get wrestled to the ground. The X-Files episode, I, I have to say, I got more email about Dr. Bambi Berenbaum than I did about getting elected to the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and it's one thing to have a character named after you, but for those of you who were at the dinner last night, and uh, for those who weren't at the dinner, uh, a big milestone in my professional career, which I should be ashamed of, but I'm not, um, is uh, if Dominic Evangelista's paper is accepted in Zuki's, there will be a cockroach named after me. So, <laughs> sort of a symmetry here. Um, he, he actually it was a fun uh, crowdfunding campaign. It's a a cockroach from Guyana that's attracted to beer baits exudes uric acid, which is a waste product, through its abdomen uh, during courtship rituals, which is presents to the female. Um, and I guess it's uh, also hung like a club-tailed uh, dragonfly. Anyway, uh, Do Dominic wanted to raise funds by encouraging people to name this loathsome creature after someone you didn't like, but I thought it was adorable. So um, with luck, it will be called Zestoblata Baumi. M-A-E, A-E is the ending for matronym, for female uh, patronym. And it's also, M-A-E is the frequent misspelling of my first name. So it's so apt that I'm really thrilled. So I hope that paper, I think I care more whether that paper gets accepted than Dominic does himself. So otherwise, uh, there goes my patronym. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to hear about uh, parsnips, uh, which are not among the world's most uh, favorite vegetables. In fact, generally, umbiliferous root crops are not dietary staples, as you see from Frank and Ernest. They are more alternate roots. Uh, and parsnips more than most. Carrots have some respect. Parsnips, not so much. Some people consider Pasinaca sativa the edible parsnip, something of an oxy oxymoron, including Ogden Nash, who wrote the poem, The Parsnip Children, I repeat, is simply an anemic beat. Some people call the parsnip edible. Myself, I find this claim incredible. Um, it's technically not an anemic beet. If it's anything, it's an anemic carrot, they, both of which belong to the family Apiaceae. About the only place in the world where parsnips are a valued uh, component of the cuisine is in uh, England and, in general, the, the British Empire, the remnants of the British Empire, uh, where they are uh, esteemed as a vegetable. And, in fact, one Englishman who was familiar with the parsnip was Charles Darwin. Uh, who in his voluminous writings did manage to mention Pasinaca's twi uh, sativa twice um, in, in two of his books, uh, including uh, variations uh, of animal plants, under, on animal and plants under domestication. So here you see all the references to parsnips. Uh, and basically, he wrote about the domestication of Pasinaca sativa, which grows as a, as a, a, a weed throughout much of Europe, where it's native. And what he, Darwin's pronouncement on parsnips basically as accustomed as we are to our excellent vegetables and luscious fruits, we can hardly persuade ourselves that the stringy roots of the wild carrot and parsnip should ever have been valued. So again, fairly remarkable that anyone actually decided that parsnip roots were edible and worth domesticating. And that was basically all Darwin had to say on Pasinaca sativa. Now, as, as disdained as it may be as a vegetable, uh, Parsnips uh, earn even less praise when they escape from cultivation, as they've done throughout much of the world where they're introduced, and essentially go rogue, rogue as, a, as, a, uh, as a weed. Uh, and it's not so, you can see, caution, wild parsnip, beware of wild parsnip. Um, they, they are uh, not 
unattractive, they don't smell bad, um, and they're not particularly uh, economically important in crops. But what they do is when you brush against them, any sort of casual contact with the above ground parts of the plant result in the eruption of a uh, oozing, painful, blistery, unsightly rash, which takes a long time to heal and ultimately uh, leaves a, a patch of uh, hyperpigmentation behind. Um, and this condition is known as phytophotodermatitis. Sometimes you see it as photophytodermatitis. And uh, it is the result of the fact that uh, all the above ground parts of the wild parsnip, as well as domesticated uh, version, contain a group of plant secondary chemicals called phoranocumarins, come basically in two flavors, as it were. Linear phoranocumarins, where the, tricyclic, uh, the three rings of the tricyclic compound are aligned, and the angular phoranocumarins, which, in which the furan ring here is attached to the coumarin nucleus, nucleus at an angle. Well, phoranocumarins are, um, uh, unusually toxic to all living things uh, in that they are capable of binding irreversibly to thymine and DNA and of sufficient you in the presence of ultraviolet light which leads they absorb quanta of ultraviolet light form an excited state and then this excited highly reactive site excited state can bind to thymine actually in opposing strands and cross-link DNA which interferes with transcription which is why they're not really compatible with, with DNA-based life, which is life on this planet as we know it. Now, there is no plant so toxic or so noxious that there isn't an insect somewhere that, that can't deal with it. And in fact, everywhere parsnip grows, uh, this insect, the parsnip webworm, Depressaria pacinacella, has pursued it and in fact feeds in many parts of its range exclusively on uh, the most phoranicumarin-rich parts of the plant. So this is Depressaria pacinacella, and its life cycle is very closely aligned to that of the wild parsnip, which, again, throughout many parts of its range, is its sole host. So both the uh, parsnip and the, the parsnip webworm are, are temperate species. They require uh, a, a chilling period in order to um, reach sexual maturity. In the case of the, of the parsnip, it's a biennial. So it spends its first year as a rosette acquiring uh, root mass, that's the edible part, uh, such as it is. In its second year, if uh, sufficient energy is present, it sends up a flowering stalk. This is where, uh, again, at the end of, of winter, uh, the parsnip webworm moths, which have overwintered, become sexually active, uh, mate, and the females will lay eggs on the, uh, the leaves of uh, the bolting plants. And as the plants bolt, the caterpillars basically seek out the flowering parts, buds, flowers, and immature fruits, where they earn their name, their common name, webworms, by webbing together uh, the uh, developing inflorescences, the, the umbel-shaped inflorescence, and feed exclusively on those uh, phranicumarin-containing structures. After a couple of weeks, when the uh, webworms are ready to pupate, they tunnel into the stem, form a silken cocoon, pupate, and then just as the seeds in the uh, umbel uh, mature, uh, the webworms emerge as uh, moths and then both spend the winter uh, best basically 10 months out of the year waiting for the next season. So it's a biennial plant. It is a, 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 a monovoltine insect. It's a plant with very few other enemies and it is an insect with very few other hosts. So we have uh, basically a monocarpic biennial that's invasive in North America with uh, well-characterized phoranicumarin defenses that are effective against most herbivores. Uh, by the same token, we have the parsnip webworm, a co-evolved specialist that feeds directly on the reproductive structures of this monocarpic biennial. So parsnips have one chance in their life to flower. Here is a herbivore that eats its reproductive structures. So this is an insect with a very high um, fitness, direct fitness impact. And as such, this is a system that is very suggestive of what in the uh, um, early 1980s, late 70s, early 80s, was considered coevolutionary warfare, where insects, this is back in the days of the Cold War, where this, sorts of, this sort of metaphor was uh, a little more uh, uh, eagerly embraced. The insect acts as a selective agent on the plant, leading to the evolution of plant defenses, which in turn act as selective agents on the insect, leading to counter defenses, which in turn select for an escalation of defenses, and so on. This is the era of the of missiles, anti-missiles, and anti-anti-missile missiles. Um, so this fit very much into the temper of the times. 
And uh, it's back when I started uh, work in graduate school. And this was um, uh, a challenging question to people in, in um, insect uh, ecology is when are, uh, when, where are, the, when, how do you know when it's coevolution? And, and basically we have Darwin to thank for the, for the criteria for establishing this reciprocal evolutionary interaction where the insect has to have a, a fitness impact on the plant mediated by this, by, by chemical defenses. The plant in turn has, turn has to act as a selective agent on the insect uh, ability to deal with the plant. And in order for coevolution to proceed, uh, the, the traits underlying the reciprocal interaction have to be, have some genetic basis in order for selection to act. So there, this was a, a very promising system uh, to begin working on. And I actually started in graduate school. Uh, and you know how ecologists like to talk about systems and how it, you, know, you have a, a, a concept in mind and you search for a system that fits. This is not actually how I started working on parsnip webworms and wild parsnips. I actually started on, wild, on working on wild parsnips and parsnip webworms and phranicomers in general because in uh, fall of 1975, when I started graduate school, my advisor, Paul Feeney, handed me a book called Biology and Chemistry, the Emboliferae, and he said, if you can find any project in that book, I can support your research. So I found a chapter on phranicomerins. These were biologically active compounds. No one had looked at their, their uh, insecticidal properties. I had to find a plant that made these things, and I didn't like to drive. I had no car. I was afraid of driving. So I left the Feeney lab, and I walked um, across the street and down a hill, and there was a patch of wild parsnip. And that's literally how my career got started, is because I was afraid to drive. Um, and you know, now I present it, just you know, what, full disclosure, it's not like I searched through the, the literature for plant-insect interactions because this was within walking distance of, of the insectary on Cornell campus. But it, in retrospect, it turned out to work as a very good model system. And um, I have to acknowledge through my uh, University of Illinois work with this plant, I worked very closely with an invaluable uh, partner uh, in research. We had a, a, a delightful interaction uh, with Art Zongrel, who had many skills that complemented whatever skills I had, among other things. He was not afraid to drive. And as you'll see, we had to go to, this is an interaction that's on, on three different geographic areas in the world, and I couldn't drive in any of them. So this, none of this would have been happened without, happened without Art who tragically died in December 2011 of a brain tumor. And I just mentioned him because this is, um, some of you in the audience knew Art. So I, you know, it, this is, much of this represents his work as well. So one of the first things we did was determine whether or not uh, Phranicumarin profile of the plant had an effect on resistance to the insect and whether, in fact, the insect could act as a selective agent on plant chemistry. So we planted out into the uh, field half sib families of genetically related individuals that varied in the phranicumarin content, and then used methods of quantitative genetics to examine uh, patterns of fitness reduction in the presence of the herbivore uh, to calculate uh, basically the selection differential and found out that uh, parsnips grown um, in the presence of webworms uh, actually select for in subsequent generations an increase in two different phranicumarins, the linear phranicumarin bergactin and the angular phranicumarin svondin. In the absence of webworms, however, uh, there was selection for reduced levels of bergactin. As it turns out, these chemicals are expensive metabolically for the plant to produce. So there's a clear fitness benefit in the presence of webworms for plants producing at least two of these phranicumarins. And uh, whether selection can act on these chemical, uh, on the chemical profiles of the plant and the, uh, the defense profile of the insect, uh, we use quantitative genetics again to estimate the half sieve her heritabilities. Uh, so the additive genetic var variance in these traits, this is the variance that, select, that is manifested in the phenotype and thus is available for selection. And in fact, there is uh, in the plant uh, g additive genetic variance for uh, the, at least these three phranicumarins, uh, and as well the metabolic capability of uh, breaking down these phranicumarins, so the basis of genetic basis for resistance to these chemicals, was also um, 
uh, significantly heritable in, in, in the caterpillar. So we had at least the potential for coevolution to occur. And what we found is when we compared populations, uh, this was again the result of a, of a criticism of a grant proposal where re reviewers said you should look at more populations than the one in Urbana. So we, we branched out and went to Piatone, Illinois, a few other locations, and uh, compared populations. And again, if there's a selective res response, we would expect that the Franicumarin profiles of the plants would differ according to the uh, insect populations. And in fact, what we found remarkably is on average, the Franicumarin profiles of the parsnips are a near perfect match for the webworm detoxification profiles. So we're, we found populations uh, where uh, plants make, for example, a lot of xanthotoxin, or a lot of uh, xanthotoxin were associated with populations where the caterpillars were very good at metabolizing xanthotoxin. So we had this phenotype matching, chemical phenotype matching, which was difficult to explain in any way other than uh, the result of an interaction. Although, again, um, we, you could criticize the fact that we, this is a snapshot in time. Uh, it's well known that parasites track their hosts. We really had no evidence that that uh, in this particular uh, set of matching populations, we couldn't differentiate between an interacting coevolutionary system or a parasite simply tracking the Franicumarin profile of its host. So we went, we sort of invented a time machine. We went back in time to when webworms were first introduced. So parsnips have been grown, believe it or not, in the United States since 1609. The very first colonists, the settlement settlers in Jamestown, for some reason thought life in, in the New World would be somehow diminished without parsnips. So the plants were brought over, they escaped from cultivation, actually the Jamestown settlement disappeared, but the parsnips persisted. And they were here from the 17th century until the mid 19th century when um, uh, actually C.B. Riley recognized that Bethune uh, was the first person to recognize uh, a new pest of parsnip feeding on the reproductive structure. It was Riley, who'd been to Europe, recognized this as a European species in, 19, in 1888. So we know that starting in 1869, webworms were infesting parsnips. So we at least have a time point. So what we did to go back in time to find out what the chemistry was when these two species first re-encountered each other in the New World was look at seeds. And the seeds uh, in the seeds, the Franicumarins are actually sealed in oil tubes called vitti uh, that line both sides of the, the fruits of a mericarp that splits, well, it's the skies of carp splits into two mericarps, and both sides of the seeds have these oil glands, and it's in the oil glands that the Franicumarins are contained, and they're sealed. And you can take uh, herbarium specimens that are 100 years old, peel off the vitti, and open them up and see what the chemistry was a century ago, and that's exactly what art did. Um, we, uh, you can actually detect the presence, so we can measure the Franicumarin chemistry through time. What about the webworms? Well, they're called webworms because when they feed on the reproductive structures, they leave behind silk and webbing. So you can actually look at the herbarium specimens and see evidence of webworms. In the case of this particular herbarium specimen, someone had actually collected the webworm and pressed it in the plant press as well. It's pretty undeniable that that plant was infested with webworms. So, um, so we got herbarium specimens from throughout the US, throughout um, uh, Europe, and, and Art painstakingly uh, examined the specimens for evidence of, you see the webbing here, and uh, we did analyses of the chemistry as well. So we had 342 seed samples from 25 North American herbaria, and we compared the chemistry of the North American samples to 58 seed samples from six European herbaria. So we had, uh, the, over the same time interval, European uh, parsnips and New World parsnips, uh, North American parsnips. And as well, uh, we uh, scored these specimens for the presence of webworm damage in North America. And what we found was there, were no, there was no evidence of webworms prior to 1890 in herbarium uh, samples. And then uh, infestation, uh, evidence of infestation grew dramatically after 1890. We started picking up silk samples. And if you look, um, so these are, uh, this is levels prior to the introduction. Post-introduction, we had a jump in Franicumarin um, 
levels in these herbarium specimens after the introduction of webworms. And uh, if you, again, this line represents European specimens in the same time intervals, and it's only after introduction, before the introduction of webworms, the herbarium specimens from North America were all lower in foranocumarin content than were the European specimens equivalent in time. Only after the introduction of webworms did they jump up. Whoops. So that suggested, at least to us, that in fact, evolution, coevolution had been taking place, that when a plant, the North American plant had been freed from the constraints of a fluorivore for a long time. The defenses were relaxed when the, the co-evolved specialist was reintroduced. Then we saw a return to investment in uh, the Franicumarins. And there's way more to that story, but a lot of you are familiar with that story. There is a new twist to the story in that, okay, so we have, it's not the, the 80s anymore. The Cold War is over, and we're more interested in detente and international collaboration. And so we have not just co-evolutionary warfare, we have co-evolutionary um, uh, war and peace. So we have EU and, uh, and, and uh, mutualistic defense pacts. And what we have in the, in the plant insect world, this is, a floor, this is a flowering plant that depends on pollinators. So uh, we have a monocarp biennial that is an obligate outcrosser. Uh, and it has a very odd reproductive system, since it has the type, topic sex in the single parsnip. And it is utterly dependent on pollinator partners, insect pollinator partners. This, about the same token, the same structures that are attractive to pollinators are consumed by this fluorivore with a high direct fitness impact. So um, we were interested then in to see uh, how the plant interacts, the same flowers that are eaten by webworms, how does the plant chemically mediate its interactions with its pollinators? Well, for a long time, people were not that interested, actually, in how parsnips were pollinated. This is not like soybeans. There's no parsnip checkoff program. Not a lot of people interested in, in the economic, uh, in economic pests of parsnip. And in fact, remember, the edible part of the parsnip is the root. These guys don't even eat the roots. Most people who grow parsnips economically are just growing them through the roots. There's about six people in North America who grow parsnips for seed production. Not a big issue. Not a lot of biology was known. So here's a, an economically important insect whose life history wasn't known. And here's a plant whose pollination biology was not that known. It was thought, like many umbellifers, that uh, parsnips were promiscuously pollinated. Talk about judgmental language here. So this is C. Ritchie Bell's 19, 18, 1972 paper, Breeding Systems of Floral Biology, the Umbilifery, Evidence for Specialization in Unspecialized fl Flowers. So promiscuous pollination in many species of unspecialized in by many species of unspecialized insects removes what is for many plants an effective isolating mechanism, but removes a limiting factor in a wide geographic distribution. So it's suggested that these that parsnip plants are a cornucopia for visiting pollinators. That, and in fact, you'll see why. OK, uh, so there's an exposed nectar. It's not concealed in a long corolla or anything. It is exposed from a structure called the silopodium, which just oozes nectar. And the whole umbe umbelliferate, uh, the umbellifer inflorescence is essentially a landing platform that um, anybody can, any insect can, irrespective of morphology, can land on. No matter how short your mouth parts are, you can suck up nectar. And, and so it makes the plant basically accessible to a wide variety of umbellifer of visitors, which I guess in the eyes of some pollination biologists makes them promiscuous. And again, this is a thought that maybe not having a particularly specialized relationship with a pollinator may make these, this plant an, a, a particularly efficient or effective colonizer of new habitats, an invasive species, because it's no, not limited by a pollinator partner when it moves to a new habitat. Now, the sex life of parsnips. OK, this is, in the language of botanists, an obligate outcrossing centrifugally protandrous sequential hermaphrodite. OK, what does that mean? Um, OK, so it starts out as a bud. It is initially male, and it becomes female uh, uh, and receptive when the, and whereupon uh, pollen is deposited, and, and then this develops as fruits. The centrifugally pr protandrous means it's an umbrella-shaped inflorescence, and it starts out male at the inside and sequentially turns male as you go further to the outside, and then it starts turning female uh, in that same pattern. So centrifugally protandrous means male first, and then sequential hermaphrodite. 
first female, then female. Why do I have this Greek mythological figure, Tiresias, the blind prophet of Thebes? Because basically, he was a very weird myth um, about this um, uh, blind, pro well, blind pro he was not blind initially, but he saw, according to mythology, copulating snakes, was struck blind, and turned into a woman for seven years, and then eventually turned back into a man. Well, Parsons can't quite carry off that last transformation, but like uh, Tiresias, they start out male and become female. And this show attracts quite an audience. Um, Charles Robertson was a, a, a biology professor at a small southern Illinois college who would uh, record on his daily walk to his, his college every pollinator, every visitor on every plant that he passed by. And he recorded over 200 species of visitors to parsnips in southern Illinois. This is a real cornucopia plant. Many, many species visit parsnips. Does not necessarily mean that it's pollinated, however. Um, so here you see the, uh, the structure of the plant. So the, uh, the first flower, the, the uh, flowering stalk produces the largest umbel, it's called the primary umbel, and these are uh, exclusively hermaphroditic. They start out male and become female, but um, off the main shoot there are secondary umbels, and then off the secondary umbels there are tertiary umbels, and the proportion of male flowers increases in higher order umbels. So the, the, uh, there are proportionately more male flowers as the uh, uh, plants differentiate. So it's a very comp at any given moment, you have all kinds of sex changes going on. So it's a, uh, uh, a plant that uh, uh, kind of defies gender stereotyping. OK, so why all this sequential sex changing? Well, it's one way the plant can prevent selfing. So of course, selfing is inbreeding, which reduces uh, variability. So uh, there are no receptive female uh, plants on the same umbel when uh, so when, when the, the umbels are male, so the sequential protandry means that, that the pollen produced by one umbel is, is being delivered to another plant to ensure cross-breeding. Uh, cross so seed set in this species is heavily limited by visitation uh, by pollinators. We know in many populations, in fact, there's a, uh, an odd phenomenon where a, a substantial portion of the ovules go unfertilized. And we know this because if you see these transparent seeds here, they are actually um, parthenocarpic. They are uh, fruits lacking seeds. They are of zero value in terms of reproduction uh, or of fitness. So unlike most uh, plants, when a seed is not fertilized, when a fruit flower is not fertilized, it's aborted and, and no seeds are produced. But parsnip produces seedless fruits, just like navel oranges. Uh, and it's, it's an unusual. Uh, phenomenon in nature, but it may have an adaptive explanation, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but it, if at least at this point, it evidenced that there is pollinator limitation. And that imposes a constraint on fitness. So about this time, uh, when we began to wonder what effect a fluorovore might have on relationships with pollinators, this was uh, getting to be a, of interest in the uh, insect ecology literature. And there are many different ways a fluorovore can affect pollinators. They can basically consume reproductive units, which directly affects fitness. They can have indirect effects by reducing the attractiveness of the floral display, either by reducing the flower numbers or the flower parts. They can increase defenses by in, in, uh, eliciting upregulation of defense pathways. They can increase defense investments in defense chemistry that may have a trade-off in uh, reducing fitness uh, by imposing a reproductive cost. Or they can introduce physical or chemical changes that are not related to defense that could discourage visitation. So there are all these theoretical possibilities. Um, and we know that, uh, there, that webworms are capable of reducing the, the number of reproductive units. And in fact, this was a study done by a Howard Hughes undergraduate during the summer showing that even one webworm in an umbel significantly reduces uh, the number of visits. Uh, so here you have male and female flowers compared to control, a significant reduction in the number of visitors. And it's not simply the fact that the, the flowering parts are, are, are webbed together and inaccessible, because we tied them together physically. And it's not simply a change in the shape. There's something that the webworm does to the plants that makes them less attractive. 
All right. Now, what about these parthenocarpic fruits? Well, maybe this is related to this long-standing coevolutionary association with a fluorivore. As it turns out, um, these embry embryoless fruits, seedless fruits, um, have very little nutritional value there. They're that only one third of the nitrogen or protein content. But uh, if you give a petri dish, you give webworms a choice between um, Embry, uh, parthenocarpic fruits and normal fruits, they will eat every single parthenocarpic fruit before they touch a normal fruit, despite the fact that these have far fewer nutrients in them. And in fact, uh, so you, these are the seed survivorships. So here you have filled fruits or seed containing fruits. Um, and they will uh, eat, so basically they leave the, the seed filled fruits until they've eaten every single parthenocarpic fruit, and only then will they eat the filled fruits. It seems like very perverse behavior. It's like eating only the Twinkies and ignoring the, you know, the steak and the vegetables. And it's kind of uh, in part because not be, it's because of the, the uh, investment that the plant makes in the parthenocarpic fruit that contain only about one third of the Phranicumarin defenses. So what the caterpillar does, you remember how those vitae are on the external surface, they basically sample the fruits. When they taste the parthenocarpic fruits, they are far less well defended, and that's what is gobbled up first. So the plants may actually retain these as decoys to draw away the uh, webworms in an, in an umble away from the valuable fruits and instead sacrifice these parthenocarpic fruits um, uh, because there is no fitness consequence for them being eaten. And all right, why is this not working? Hello? OK, all right, so let's see. OK, so um, we wanted to know how, uh, and we know that phranicomans are important in the uh, deterrence of, of webworms. What we didn't know is what chemistry associated with the, the flowering parts are um, associated with defense. So uh, we um, uh, were interested in most likely pollinators respond to volatiles. And in fact, parsnips, uh, whatever else their shortcomings, do produce a diversity of, of volatiles, which change throughout the developmental status of the, of the flowers. Without webworms, uh, in the absence of a fluorivore, we wanted to find out what the attractions were, and the design of a parsnip plant is ideal for a controlled study, because these umbels, the secondary umbels, are paired. They are synchronous in time. They're, produced, they're symmetric and synchronous in time. So uh, we were able to use these phenologically and morphologically sim similar sec secondary umbels, where we could use one secondary umbel to monitor the volatility re release. At the same time, we were monitoring the, secondary, the other secondary, paired secondary umbel for visitation. And how did we do this? Well, we bagged the umbels and removed the bags, set up cameras, automatically to take pictures at three minute intervals of the visitors, rebagged them after five hours, and then waited seven to 10 days, and then looked at how many of the, of the receptive female fruits had been fertilized, female flowers. Here the, you see them, you can tell when they're receptive because that bifurcated stigma separates. That means they're ready for pollination. So at that exact moment when they're ready for pollination, we um, exposed them to pollinators, five hours recorded the visitors, then looked to see what pollination success was. Uh, on the other umble, the paired umble, uh, the same five-hour period, we did dynamic headspace sampling on Poropac and then uh, uh, eluded that sample and looked at GC mass spec to determine what the volatiles were. Visitation analysis, we had 50 plants on a four-week period. 5,000 photos were analyzed. We had 9,200 visits, which is an integration of visits and visit duration. And these photographs were of sufficient quality we could actually identify many of the visitors. In addition, we looked at the flowers to see which ones were producing nectar, to see if nectar secretion, would look shiny in the picture, is uh, involved in attraction. We found 73 species of visitors in this five-hour uh, period. And then we collected representative visitors and, and looked at the pollen loads to see if any of these visitors were actually collecting pollen or taking away pollen. We had a huge amount of variation, both in the uh, body mass of the visitors and the pollen loads. And not all of them were necessarily matching. We had some very large visitors with very low pollen loads and some very small visitors with very large pollen, pollen loads. But by, by and large, important visitors appeared to be surfids and, and other dip, diptera. 
in looking at the nectar reward in yet another umbel on the, on the plant, we analyzed the chemistry and we found sucrose, glucose, and fructose, not surprisingly, small amounts of other sugars. And we found uh, no qualitative variation in, in nectar, although we did find differences in production of nectar. So the, the proportion of flowers bearing nectar was in fact correlated with visitation of all our, our 73 species only by flies. So flies responded to the presence of nectar, um, particularly uh, large calyptrate flies and, and uh, both large and small surfeits. Whoops. And these are the visitors, the large flies, medium flies, and large and small surfeits that were for which the number of visits is correlated with seed set. So we had frequent visitors like uh, Coleognathus uh, pennsylvanicus, which is a soldier beetle, and ants, frequent visitors, but they were not correlated with seed production. So they were not acting as pollinators. These appear to be the major pollinators. Nectar plays a role. The volatiles, well, we looked at the volatile components of flower emissions. We found monoterpenes, aliphatic esters, sesquiterpenes, uh, phenylpropanoid, and a couple of other compounds, and did factor analysis, principal components analysis to see what uh, was the best, which components were uh, closely associated with seed set. Among the visitors, we found um, along the first uh, um, principal component, again, those medium and large flies in the surfids were the most significantly correlated. Among the volatiles that were uh, the principal component that was best predictive of, of seed set, we had octanol, hexylbutyrate, octalacetate, uh, so we had hexyl and butyl, uh, hexyl and octyl esters. So seed production and parsnip uninfested appears to depend on flies, nectar production, and octyl esters. With webworms, we did the same experiment, but we had visitation and seed set in paired secondary umbels with, without webworms and with webworms. So we could monitor visitation. And we found that when webworms are present, we got a different set of visitors that were predictive of seed set. So in addition, in intact umbels, large diptera were associated with seed production. But in the presence of webworms, we also got small diptera and surfids that were predictive. Webworms directly reduce fitness by reducing the number of receptive flowers per umbel. So they clearly have a direct impact on fitness. What about an indirect effect? Other than removal, are they having an indirect effect? So we wanted to look for an interaction between webworms and pollinator. And basically did not find one, which was a bit surprising. And when we looked at the specific plants, it made very little sense because we had, uh, for some plants, three plants, visitation was affected by webworms, as was fertilization. For others, we had a visitation affected by webworms, but no fertilization. Uh, there are two plants where there was visitation was unaffected, but fertilization was affected. And then uh, six plants where there was no where visitation and fertilization were both unaffected. How can a herbivore have positive effects on pollination in some plants and negative effects in others? Well, maybe because webworms differentially affect the chemistry. So we monitored the volatile release of umbels with and without uh, webworms, again, in a paired uh, secondary umbel experiment. And what we found was uh, basically uh, webworms, the presence of webworms caused an increase in release of all volatiles. And again, those oil glands, those uh, vitae, um, are basically where all the volatiles are sealed. Physical damage releases volatiles. But webworms, so webworms increase release of all the volatiles, particularly the aliphatic esters, and a, a terpene called uh, germacrine D. But we also found that four of the infested in, in umbels, only four, emitted a compound called octanol. None of the intact umbels emitted octanol. Well, it turns out octanol is the a uh, metabolite of octalbutyrate and octalacetate. Webworms metabolize these compounds. So the webworms are adding to the volatile bouquet of the plant basically uh, metabolites of, of compounds that are actually toxic to them. Um, so uh, we looked at frass, uh, uh, volatile emissions from frass, and sure enough, uh, plant uh, volatiles differ from frass volatiles mainly in the presence of octanol. So the frass of webworms is loaded with octanol, which is a breakdown product of octal acetate and octal butyrate. So webworms, by eating these, uh, these floral chemicals, actually change the profile of the plant uh, and add a chemical that isn't present otherwise. 
So why do they metabolize things? As it turns out, y 2 both actometer tests show that octal acetate is actually attractive to the caterpillars. It's made only in the flowering parts. Remember, the eggs are laid on the leaves. The caterpillars find their way to the flowering parts by following octal acetate. Octal butyrate, once they eat it, actually is toxic to them. So it's important for the caterpillars to find and metabolize these, these esters. So in conclusion, octal butyrate um, is defensive against webworms. Octal acetate may be a bad thing to have because it attracts webworms. And then there's mericin, which is another chemical that actually inhibits the ability of webworms to metabolize franicumarins. So um, all of this, these interactions affect relationships with pollinators. What about the evolutionary consequences in the next six minutes? OK, um, parsnips. OK, remember, invasive all around the world. In 2004, we were probably the only people in the world to be absolutely delighted to hear that webworms showed up in New Zealand for the first time in 150 years. And amazingly, New Zealand, remember, a member of the British Empire, one of the other few places in the world where people actually care about parsnips. So the presence of the parsnip webworm made news releases that had a huge impact on the plant. So here's a place, New Zealand, they're passionate about parsnips. Here you see a, a seed company, that, a, a produce company that, so parsnips are integral to the New Zealand diet. Uh, and uh, so this was a great opportunity for us to see what happens when a co-evolved association becomes reassociated. Here's a plant that has grown in the wild for 150 years without a major enemy. What happens when its co-evolved enemy shows up again? So we went, uh, we went to, uh, Art went to New Zealand, drove, driving on the other side of the road, and found enormous fitness impacts. Here you see the black. This is, these are plants in different populations where, you know, three quarters of them produce no seeds at all. You can see in, in incredible fitness impacts. Cross section of the stem. In North America, we get one or two webworms per stem. Here you can see they're jam packed, crowded, enormous populations of webworms. And a cluster analysis of parsnip populations in native Europe, invasive US with 150 years of association, and brand new, Euro, uh, brand new New Zealand showed us in New Zealand actually the franicum profiles are very low compared to everywhere else in the world. So New Zealand plants are not well defended. They pr produce less than average franicumarins. And this actually made headlines in New Zealand. Veg caught with its defenses down. But what was it really intriguing to us is not just the franicumarin chemistry change, the volatile chemistry and the absence of the fluorovore. What we found was uh, New Zealand plants actually made more of the attractant to webworms. So in the absence of a fluorovore, the possibility existed that maybe they are better at advertising to their partners rather than hiding themselves from their enemies. So graduate student Tanya Joges, whom I just hooded on Saturday, and uh, our collaborator in New Zealand, Margaret Stanley, um, basically repeated our experiment um, where we uh, bagged umbels, released them for when they were receptive, measured the volatiles, measured the visitation, and uh, we, what we found was, was kind of surprising for this um, promiscuously pollinated plant, we found common elements in visitation between New Zealand and the US. Uh, not uh, many taxa were unique to one or the other places, but we did find the same muscoid diptera uh, were principal visitors, and the surfids in particular were important visitors on both continents. We had pollen loads that varied geographically, but again, the large sur the surfids and the um, uh, the muscoid diptera were very important. Also in the US and New Zealand, we had visitors that were unhelpful. We had uh, soldier beaters in the US, very abundant, but never carried pollen, as well as bibionid flies all over the, the parsnip umbels. But the thing is, both of these species, both New World and Old World, spent all of their time mating on these umbellifer platforms instead of actually going around and pollinating things. So I told you, there, you know, the title said there'd be sex in this, in this talk, and there you see copulating beetles and flies. But despite the geographic differences in visitation frequency in the, both the US and New Zealand populations, the percentage of flowers that set seed were predicted by, here you see large muscoid diptera, that's uh, pollination success in the US, uh, pollination success with small surfaces significantly uh, or significantly associated, and here in New Zealand, pollination success, large muscoids and small uh, diptera, so small surfids. 
So they're not so pr promiscuous. They are in two different hemispheres associating with the same taxa. Now, what about the floral bouquets? In the US, we had 16 compounds, including osamines, and we do, separated these into four clusters that differed in 15 of the 16 compounds. So we did cluster analysis and characterized the, the, the chemical, the plants, by their chemotypes. We had four different chemotypes. Uh, plants in cluster one were low in everything. Cluster two and three, slightly higher levels. Cluster three had the uh, higher levels of esters, and plants in four had higher amounts of all compounds except esters. So we, in New Zealand, we, had, we did a cluster analysis. We found a similar number of compounds, a few compounds, 20 constituents, more than we found um, in, in uh, the US, did cluster analysis, found three clusters that didn't differ in esters, but differed in monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, and, and meristocin. And in the US, for US parsnips, um, we had differential visitation by the large muscoid flies, small surfids, medium muscoid flies, and, and ants that, that differed among clusters. And most of the visitors uh, preferred clusters two and three. And actually, only the small surfids cared about nectar availability. That's um, where you can see that right here. Uh, nectar availability. In New Zealand, visitation did not differ depending on, on the chemotype of the plant, but nectar was a significant predictor of visitation by small surfaces. So what does this mean? In the US, the two clusters that were highest in esters received the highest number of visitors and experienced the highest pollination success. The clus clusters in New Zealand, parsnips, which differed in terpenes but not esters, did not differ in visitation by any pollinator group. So the uniformity in the visit frequency of visitation between clusters may be due to the fact that all clusters were producing esters equivalently, and these esters are the key to pollination success. And in fact, in New Zealand, plants were better at getting pollinated. They had a higher percentage. 32% of the plants experienced greater than 50% fertilization than in the US, where it was only 20%. So again, leaving your enemies behind may enable a plant to be more attractive to its, its partners, its mutualists. Higher octal acetate in the floral bouquet of New Zealand parsnips may be a more pollinator attractive volatile profile when there is no florivory, which means that esters may have a dual role mediating both floribore defense and pollinator attraction. So invading new habitats for the parsnip may mean escaping your enemy and making new friends in a new hemisphere. And in fact, parsnips have made new friends here in, in Australia, the other part of the British Empire. They actually like parsnips, where you can see from the Sydney Market Credit Services, parsnips are perfect for putting on plates. Parsnips are perfect for roasting and bakes. Parsnips are pleasures when teamed up with steaks. Parsnips are something to share with your mates. Thank you for letting me share parsnips with you. Thanks to many, many undergraduates and graduate students who helped with this project, and especially thanks to Art who was uh, just an absolutely essential talk about partners. This was a, a great, a mutualistic interaction um, for 28 years. So thank you. And I just, uh, like yesterday, finished six minutes behind. So thank you. So do we have time for questions? One question? Oh. Anybody have a question? Yes, thank you for asking. Genus Depressary is a huge genus, right? And lots of other species of that moth in that genus? Anything I wouldn't call it a huge genus, oh, but... Yeah. Oh, it, is there anything to be learned from other species of Depressaria fitting on other members of the character? Um, well, it, it's interesting that this is not a group that's it's attracted a lot of attention for systematists. And the Depressaria in the western US have very different uh, relationship with their plants. There's some, uh, John Thompson worked with some of the Western Depressaria, Depressariae and Ecophorids, and they are not exclusive floribores, as are the old world uh, Depressariums. So there, there may be, there are differences, of, and in fact, there's a big radiation of Depressariums in the Western US on Lomatium, which is a chemically very different umbellifer from uh, the Depressariums, Depressaria sensu stricto in Europe, which associate with parsnip and heraclium, which are chemically very similar and, and very defended with, uh, very highly defended with Phranicumarins. So I'm, I'm, you know, if someone were to look at this taxon, you know, with molecular methods, I'm not sure we would necessarily see that this is one giant genus after all. Uh, what there is, to, I think there are things to learn about other florivores, and florivores are a special kind of herbivore, and they can really have a greater fitness impact 
on, uh, on their host than can a folivore because they are directly consuming reproductive structures. So, um, is that, does that answer? Is it just some novel feature of just this one species? Or no, I, I'm sure, that's what I'm saying, maybe not just this taxon, but florivores in general, I think, present a particular challenge to, to, um, uh, to plants. Uh, because, again, because uh, there's escaping your enemies and at the same time advertising your readiness for pollinators, and that's, that's a, a real challenge. Um, and I think there are lessons to be learned from other florivore, flor, florivory systems, not necessarily other deeper cerium ecophores. Uh, this bot, by the way, I think is the most economically important deeper cerium ecophore, which doesn't say much for, you know, any sort of large grants from commodity groups. So. Yes, hi. So I'm intrigued by your suggestion that having some seedless fruits might be a good thing for the plant as a way of minimizing so with that in mind, do you think there's an optimal level of seed set for this plant? Is it less than 100%? And if so, does the plant do something perhaps to achieve that less than maximal seed set? This is something we were always very interested in trying to, we wanted to see actually if the variation in the production of parthenocarpic fruits is under genetic control, which would suggest there is some opt optimal level. But um, it, it's hard to say whether this is just a, a you know, that the parthenocarpic fruits are retained uh, only because there's no particular fitness cost to, to aborting them in the presence of the herbivore. Um, this is something we would like to, we have populations in New Zealand which are free from herbivory, which would be good for testing. In, in North America, it's actually hard to find parsnips that don't have webworms. If you go far enough south, the webworms drop out before the plant does, but then you're, you're way south. I mean, you've got all kinds of edaphic and climatic variation as well. Um, so it, it's hard to argue that this is, you know, a strategy on the part of the plant. It may just be um, a lack of selection against retaining an unsuccessful um, uh, fruit. Uh, anybody here an expert on pistachios? Because they do the same thing. They, they are wind pollinated, but they retain... Um, seedless fruits, I mean, empty fruits. I don't know if anybody, I, I've been to one pistachio grove, ranch, her flock, whatever they're called here. Um, and I know it was an odd phenomenon. I've not, not seen it. Other than navel oranges, it's kind of hard to find. Not a big literature on parthenocarpic fruits. But that's a, it's a really intriguing question. Any other questions, comments, concerns, issues? Anybody a fan of parsnips? Oh, wow, I'm impressed, geez. I, I actually am under contract to write a book about, it's called The Secret Life of Parsnips. And one reason I have not finished it is I'm not convinced anyone would buy it. Yeah. So it's kind of discouraging. Oh, thank you, everybody.